Weekly, and we're going to do a quick Q&A, just kind of talk about the movie. We have Pete Berg, director of the movie, coming up here. And we are we're also joined by Sarah Aubrey, who is the producer of the film, and Pete's producer. Thank you guys for coming. Thank you very much. So, so Pete, you were shooting Hancock when Sarah brought this to your attention, is that correct? <clears throat> yep, we were uh, shooting and uh, Sarah told me that there was a book called Lone Survivor and there was a, an ex-Navy SEAL, Marcus Luttrell, who was in town taking meetings and she uh, very aggressively encouraged me to read the book. Uh, which I did um, immediately because uh, she's very persuasive and um, we then, you know, aggressively threw our hats into the ring and uh, you know, fortunate to get, uh, get, get the rights to it. Why did it resonate with both of you? Sarah, what was it when you, when you read this that you were like, we need to make this movie? I think what I was most struck by was it was this incredibly intimate account of bravery what it means to sacrifice for the person next to you. And not just the SEALs, but also the whole Afghan village. Because, you know, it's easy to be tough or brave when you have overwhelming numbers or you have a dominance over the situation. But in both instances, um, these men were outnumbered. They were the underdogs and they still fought with a ferocity um, and a love for each other that I found incredibly moving. Mm. Pete, when did you meet Marcus? Because I know he came in early to talk about, you know, what what his involvement would be, kind of what his story would look like as it was brought to the screen. Well, the, the first um, the, the first night I met him was close to the time we were talking about when I read the book. Um, he, I read the book quickly, and in the, like that day I read the book, like in a two-hour period, three-hour period and called and he was getting ready to fly back to Texas. He had met with a bunch of people and I had a film, The Kingdom, that was uh, almost done and I said to him, uh, you know, go if you want, stay an extra night, we'll, sh we'll show you The Kingdom and if you like that or you're interested, I'd be happy to meet with you and he agreed and we saw it that evening and then I met with him for like a late dinner that night and we ended up talking for a, quite a while and at the end of that dinner, he, he told me that I, I could do it and that, that I better not mess it up. <laughs> well, what was your reaction to meeting Marcus? Because having spoken to him myself, there's not, he's not wooed by the fact that, that I'm at Entertainment Weekly. He's not wooed by Hollywood in any way. Uh, what was your reaction meeting him? Were you intimidated by him? Yes, or? I mean, meeting Marcus and you know, Sarah and I have now met so many SEALs and you know, we met with, the first thing that Sarah and I did was we flew to Northern California to meet with Mr. and Mrs. Axelson, and we went to Colorado to meet with the Geeches. We went to New York to meet with the Murphys, and you know we've met with all the the moms and dads of these soldiers who were killed, and their brothers and their sisters and their ex their widows, um, and and their friends, their brothers who were still in the SEAL community, and you know these, these people are very intense human beings, and. Um, we feel, felt an extra responsibility to that community to, um, you know, respect them, understand who their who their sons were, and, and try and tell the story. So it wasn't just Marcus; it was the whole community. And, and you went. I mean, you actually embedded yourself in Afghanistan in a SEAL team, correct? I did because you know when I was writing the script, the SEALs are a very unique group of people, and they're not. Uh, the warmest and fuzziest initially. It take, takes a minute, a few dates to kind of get them to warm up to you. Um, they're very skeptical of outsiders and very skeptical of anyone in, in media. Um, and so over a year or so, I, I, when I was writing, wanted to try and understand the culture more. And I just kept asking and asking and finally they let me go to Iraq and I got to embed with a small platoon up by the Syrian border for a month, and that was uh, the, really one of the great times of my life. Wow. What do you do in that situation? You just kind of follow along and keep your mouth shut? I mean, it, it was pretty intense. You know, these guys, they, 
their their job is to go kill people, and that's what they do, and that's what they're very good at doing. And um, uh, you know, it, it's a job that you know I believe has to be done. I believe there are bad people out there, and uh, there's nothing wrong with uh, supporting these men and then supporting the fact that there are people who are willing to put themselves in between us and some very bad people. And I feel, you know. Uh, blessed to have been able to spend time with these men, seeing um, how intelligent they are, how, how much love for each other they have, how much respect for human life they have. Um, moments like the, the goat herder sequence in this film were, were scenes that I saw played out many times when I was in Iraq where you're asking a small group of young men, you know, generally in their mid-twenties, to make very complicated decisions um, in, a, in a way that there's really very little room for error. And so being with them impressed that uh, just how lucky we are to have them uh, and, and how talented these men are. When you were shooting the film, did you, how involved were, were SEAL members, whether they were former or present, in the actual production of the movie? Uh, incredibly involved. Um, we started the process of, frankly, training ourselves and the actors by going to Marcus and saying to him, who would you like to be present for you on set to make sure we get it right? And so he directed us to um, a handful of, of key guys, former and current SEALs, um, and they were with us every step of the way, and the actors every step of the way, not just teaching the technical aspects of how to be a SEAL, how to look right holding your gun, how to move, how to talk to each other, how to communicate, but also the mental aspect, which to them was the most important thing to impart, which is moving with this quiet confidence in every situation and knowing, knowing that you are going to dominate. And I think that that, if you ask the actors, was kind of the biggest takeaway beyond just um, the technical training. And, and so uh, they were invaluable to us and empowered at every stage to give us feedback before and during shooting. Tell me about when your bearded battalion of Hollywood actors uh, met, the, met these actual SEALs. I mean, did... did did Mark Wahlberg and Taylor Kitsch and Emil Hirsch, I mean, when, when there were actually the SEALs on set, were they, was there a camaraderie or were the, did the guys generally stay quiet and, and mind each other's business? No, I think, um, you know, again, the, the, the actors, the, the producers, the, the entire film crew, you know, you saw um, some of those stunts, the, the falling down of the mountain was some of the most dangerous stunts I've ever been a part of. And, um, the, the the entire crew and I put the cast in, in you know in that in that pod because this this wasn't a typical film where we had big star trailers and entourages. We'd get on the chairlift in the morning and Mark Wahlberg would get a light and an egg salad sandwich and go up to the top of the mountain and carry the equipment and um, you know because the seals were on the set because we all we had spent so much time with the families there, there was nothing other than a desire on part of everyone, including the actors, to just try and get it right. So the, the actors were very humble, very respectful, um, very much aware of the fact that they were not as tough as these men and that they were not going to ever be as tough as these men. And the best they could do was use all of their skill as professional actors to try and capture their essence. So it was, uh, it, it was, it was a very humble experience. On, on, part of our crew and our cast dealing with the SEALs. And when he talks about the chairlift, the thing that's super fascinating about this, that you shot in New Mexico and in Arizona, and a lot of the stuff on the mountain was actually at a ski lodge, correct? Yeah. So you would actually put all the gear... On the chairlift. On, in the chairlift in the mornings. Yeah. And, uh, and as I understand... It was so, slow. <laughs> the, the, the SEALs would just put a bunch of stuff on their, on their backs and, and get it up there, which... Uh, it's kind of, it fits with the feel of the movie. It's a gritty story. Um, now, when you, did you have, was there any way you tried to foster the feeling, especially when you're on base, of what it was like for the, for the SEALs that were out there in Afghanistan? Did you try and create that mood somehow on set, whether it was with music or, or, or the dress or the tone of anything? I mean, I... I music? Yeah. No music, I guess. 
They didn't have any music. Uh, I mean, again, I think... Uh, I heard the rumor you, you did not allow the crew to shave. Yeah, there was no shaving, that's true. Um, the, the, it, it, it's, hard, it's hard to explain if you guys, I'm sure some of you have been on film sets. This was a very different experience. Uh, it was a no, no frill shoot, and you know, I think one of the things that, that, that we've learned and as a result of the proximity we've had to this culture, um, you know, we can uh, tend to get pretty soft as a culture, I think, and um, we can probably all, all learn to push ourselves a little bit harder. And the film, film business in particular, I think um, movies are made with too much money. Um, People are paid too much money, people are a bit too entitled, and we couldn't help but be caught up in this, and I said patriotic in a very non-political sense, but a truly patriotic quality that these men had. And, and as a result, the crew worked for, everybody worked for less money, the actors worked for less money, um, there was never any complaining about conditions or you know, over time, everybody just wanted to tell this story, and so I didn't, I didn't have to, uh, I didn't have to put any kind of music on or anything like that. Um, but we, we did have an, a no shaving policy, which not for the women, but for. The women. <laughs> what is there? Is there a heightened sense, or is there a an, a fear, or is it scary at all to film something that you said patriotic, not in a political sense, but this obviously deals on, you know, political ground, and some people don't like movies necessarily about war that kind of go there and talk about tensions in the Middle East. Is it scary going into that situation, actually shooting those scenes, making that, making a movie like this? I mean, for me, um, you know, I, my, my love for, for these men is, is, you know, without any any kind of remorse or any, there's no ambiguity to it. I I believe so strongly um, in in what these men do and the bond that they have for each other and the fact that they are truly willing to go out and die for any one of us in this room, regardless of who's in the White House, regardless of where they're told to go do it. They truly will fight for you, and that's a blessing. And that's what I love about. The men and women who are in our military, that's what I love about Navy SEALs, and that's what we connected to so strongly um, in this in this story. We we wanted to divorce the politics and what, whether or not you think we should have ever gone into Afghanistan or not has absolutely no concern to me. But when we pick up the paper and, you know, we read that three guys were killed in Iraq or seven guys were killed in Afghanistan or a helicopter blew up in Somalia and uh, the news cycle that we live in is so intense and we can't, and it's understandable, we just can't take the time to sit with it. And when I read Marcus's book, I sat with it and it made me realize that it, these are all stories worth taking two hours and acknowledging that there are men out there great men, really, I think some of the best and the brightest that we have as a country, we're dying, and they're doing it for us. So, politics are not of interest to me. One of my, one of my favorite stories that has come out of uh, reporting on this movie was Mark Wahlberg actually told me that when you were filming some of the sequences in the Afghanistan village, uh, there was just a big football game going on in between takes with some of the guys that were playing the, the guys in the Taliban and uh, some of the SEALs as well, which I thought was a, a cool image, I guess, in, in the vein of, of it not being uh, an overt political statement in any way. I think, uh, take me inside some of the viewing, some of the, the screenings with the families that have been able to see this movie. What's their response to it? Well, I mean, I think to speak for Pete, um, because we shared this experience together, and it was one of the most memorable experiences, I think, of our lives, and one of the most nerve-wracking was showing this completed film to the families of the men that lost their lives in Operation Red Wings. And um, I think we had trepidation because of the intensity, um, obviously, of the movie that you just saw, and I, we thought that that would bring up a lot of emotion. Um, and obviously we wanted to make these families proud when this movie is shown um, here and around the world. And so we had a small screening in Los Angeles when Universal traveled all the families um, to watch the movie. 
and it was extraordinary. Uh, their response afterward, there were definitely tears, and I think um, you know a lot of feelings brought up. But to a person, they said thank you very much for honoring our sons, our husbands, our brothers, and. You know, for us, that's kind of everything. It's the reason why we mm. made the movie because now these men will live forever. So, and uh, is do they do they want to see it again ever? Do they are, is the feeling uh, is it hard for them to watch or is it nice for them to watch in any way? Oh, um, they do want to see it again. We we had a kind of a wild experience. Um, the helicopter that blew up. The, the flight crew, there were six guys on that helicopter who were not Navy SEALs. Those, those guys are part of a, an air wing called the 160, and they're, they're, actual, they're called Night Stalkers. That's what they go by, and if anyone's in the military, you may have heard of them. They're kind of the Navy SEALs of pilots, and they're the ones who fly the most dangerous missions. So for things like the Bin Laden hit, you know, that the SEAL Team 6 uses, these guys are just fearless pilots, and they're, and they're remarkable with helicopters. And they were kind of the um, un unsung heroes of the book. Marcus, you know, didn't focus on that story, which was its own incredible story. Um, and we, after we had shown the family to the SEALs, showed the movie in the East Coast to the families of the Night Stalkers. And they hadn't really received as much attention. Um, and, and we showed it to them, and there were about 70 of them in the theater. And when the lights came up, the, it was at a uh, like a regular like AMC theater that we'd rented out of theater, and um, the lights came up, and the family was very emotional, and they went to this guy who works with us, Braden, who was there, and they thanked him, and they were crying. And it, it was eleven o'clock at night, and and they all had a long talk, and by midnight they were all kind of walking out, and Braden said goodbye to them, and and one of them, the dads, came up and said, "Could we?" Uh, would it be possible for us to see the film again? And Braden was like, sure, we can set that up. When do you want to do it? He said, right now. <laughs> and, and they watched it again, and I think it started at one, and they watched it back to back, and that was uh, pretty intense for us to hear that. Yeah. Now, when did Mark Wahlberg come along the project? Was he, was he someone that you sought out, or did he seek you out and to be in this? Uh, I think I sought him out. I sent him the book. Mark's been a good friend for a long time, and you know, there's a, there's a slight height uh, difference. Six between, five and five eight. A little <laughs> bit, and the accent, you know, Boston versus Texas. But I always said that um, if if you know Mark, Mark's you know, a pretty tough guy, and, and he's very physically competent and a solid, strong guy. But if you know him, he's an incredibly sweet, loving person. He's a very sweet spirit. And Latrell, despite his six foot seven frame, once you get to know him, which takes a bit, he's an incredibly loyal and loving guy. And I felt like that, uh, Mark Wahlberg had the right stuff to play that role. Uh, Mark just told me that Mark gave him a call when when he was going to be playing the part, and the conversation basically went, "Hey, buddy, uh, we doing this?" And that was uh, the extent of that. That was pretty much Mark asking for his. For his favor to to play the part, which they're both kind of uh, no nonsense guys, so it, so it works out. Let's also talk about Taylor Kitsch. You uh, you started with him with Friday Night Lights, which is amazing and everyone loves. Um, and we Battleship, we have this. Or how long how long into the future will you be working with Taylor Kitsch? I, I hope never. I can't tell you. Uh, yeah, he's like my crazy little brother. You know, I'm, we love him and. Um, you know, it's, it's one of the fun things about our business is you kind of can form a family of, of actors and crew members and, you know, we're like gypsies. We travel all around the world together and um, have to trust and, um, and you know, not, not only trust each other, but hopefully enjoy each other. We end up on airports and, you know, shitty hotels and, you know, all over the place. And it's fun to find people that, that are your friends and that you can share in that adventure. And, um, you know, Taylor's definitely part of that for us. Someone that everyone I've spoken to around this movie has talked about uh, with complete fondness is Ben Foster. Uh, they wanted, uh, Marcus said he, he had him in mind to play Axelson before the movie had even started. Mark, I know, fought hard to have him be in the production. Uh, what's he like on set to work with? Is he, 
and, and I guess I don't really know the tone of the set, how much choking there can be out there. Well, we, so we, we, my, my film sets tend to have a lot of improvisation and there's a looseness to them and, and you know, whatever your style of acting, that we'll, we'll figure out a way to accommodate that. You know, I, I think Ben Foster is going to be really the next Daniel Day-Lewis. He, he's the, the best actor that I've ever worked with for, for many reasons. Um, but, but he does take things um, a little a little seriously sometimes. And, like, remember um, when they fell off the cliff the second time, right, where the rattlesnake was? We, we filmed the rattlesnake, and we're getting ready to film Ben Foster's coverage of him kind of waking up and looking up and seeing them. And... We'd set up some cameras, and I was off doing something, and, and Mark Wahlberg came up to me, and he's like, uh, Hey, Pete, uh, Ben's eating dirt. <laughs> I said, Why? He said, Look, he's eating. And I looked over, and Ben was like taking dirt and eating handfuls of dirt. I'm like, Ben, what are you doing? He's like, Don't worry about it. You just tell me when you're ready, and let me do my thing. And he ate two giant handfuls of dirt. I don't know why. I, 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 I can kind of guess why, sort of, but not really. But he ate two big ass handfuls of dirt, so not a lot of guys. So mad. Um, well, we actually have time to take a couple questions from from the audience. So uh, I, I guess we'll, sure. we'll start here. Yeah. Uh, thank you, first of all, both of you, for bringing this movie to us. I'm, the thing that made me be able to sit in my seat was the tone of the film and the crafting of the film. The performances are, are all actors who would be proud of these actors, but particularly the music. And I'd like you to talk a little bit about how you made a decision for explosions and how that music was weaved in and out, because that's what made it possible for me to sit when I wanted to get up and leave. So the question was about the, the music that's woven throughout the film and how it, uh, as gentleman says, it, it made it possible for him to watch the action because the music, the way it was woven in and out with the explosions. And, and well, just, when, we, when we did that. Friday Night Lights, um, um, we wanted to do a film about the movie. We, wanted to move, we were doing a movie about football, and wanted, but the book really spoke to a, an emotion or a sort of a spirit. There was a more gentle kind of overarching theme that the book had. And, and when we were thinking about music for Friday Night Lights, we found this band in Texas called uh, Explosions in the Sky. It's just an extremely emotional band. Mm -hmm. four, four, three guitar players and a drummer, and very, very talented, very emotional band. And we talked to them while, early on, years ago, about trying to find a similar approach to a combat film. And, you know, we talked to that band about, you know, could they reinvent their sound so it didn't sound like Friday Night Lights? but they've got a very unique ability. They call it tragic and triumphant at the same time. And, um, you know, it's not overly aggro and overly macho, and it's not celebratory in the sense of, mm -hmm. you know, celebrating murder or death or violence, but, um, you know, a very emotional. And, and they were uh, critical, you know, and they were like the first people we hired. And they're right here. Um, were there, how true did this stay to the... Uh, the story and how how are you able to uh, figure out what to show, what not to show? Because there's just uh, so much that's compacted in here. And also, did you get a chance to speak to any of the Afghanis that have been involved in any way? Yeah, um, Gulab, who, who's the Afghan that saved Marcus, is uh, he's he's here now and he's in Texas. And uh, uh, um, what date's the date? What's the eighth? If you watch 60 Minutes on the 8th, they're doing pretty much the whole 60 Minutes is Marcus and Gulab in Texas, which is an incredible, incredible story. Yeah, it's a great friendship. Um, and uh, um, so it should be, so it's sort of, we're not allowed to show Gulab because 60 Minutes, you know, they take themselves very seriously. They're, they're doing this, but they have to be, they can never be filmed together until after 60 Minutes. Well, we respect 60 Minutes. <laughs> um, but uh, it, this story is very true. In the, in the book, Marcus was, the movie is so very true to the book. Marcus was in that village for five days for real instead of two. We condensed that. Um, but, but, you know, if you, if you talk to Marcus or anybody in the military who was involved in after action reports, and um, that, the, the movie is very accurate. And maybe one more, and we'll go right here. 
deciding not to translate uh, a lot of the, I guess, uh, Afghani, particularly the goats, for example. You know, the, in the book, he uh, yes, why, why we didn't translate all of it. In, in, I, you know, I, Marcus didn't understand a thing that was being said at any point. You know, and that to me was, you know, that, I was impressed by, you know, that. And trying try to imagine, you know, in addition to biting your tongue out, losing your teeth, getting shot three times, breaking your femur, cracking two vertebrae, you can't understand a word that's, you know, it's... And, and so, I, 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 I originally don't want to have any subtitles. Some of those scenes went on for so long that um, I felt like we needed some. Um, so it was just kind of our seasoning to taste. Um, you want me to tell you what the goat herder said to them when he was walking away? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, okay, but you can't tell anybody. <laughs> this guy's got a camera. Um, so the, the, the old man that was walking out, he was uh, Mr. Rahimi, who was a, uh, the, they were all from Afghanistan. And they had all been moved to the States by the U.S. government because they had worked with the Americans as interpreters or in general helped them, the U.S., fight the Taliban. So they had been moved to the U.S. for safety. And they, they work as role players for the U.S. military where they have these <laughs> fake Afghan villages all over these different bases and soldiers who are getting ready to deploy will get to interact. And so Mr. Rahimi and his sons kind of were our core. And they knew the Taliban and they fought. Mr. Rahimi had been shot a couple of times. And... We asked him through his sons, who, because he didn't speak English, to, to put a curse. If, if, if there's a curse, that, that, that is a curse in Afghan that would like, you know, spook someone. So they talked about it and then they said, yeah, and Mr. Rahimi said that and, and walked off. And was, we all were kind of like, what, what did he just say? So, and his sons finally told us and it says, uh, uh, in the morning you will wake up with all of your blood outside of your body. <laughs> Which, if anyone ever says that to you in Pashtun, that's, that's bad. <laughs> it's very bad, and you should take that seriously. That's a very serious threat. Well, uh, that, that's the time that we have, and I think... Uh, well, we got one more? We got one more. It's Pete's call. I'm not going to go against it. Um, <laughs> uh, 83 years ago, in 1930, all uh, quiet on the West Thank you. <laughs> now, what's this for my question? obviously a, a, a big plot point in the film and it was a part of the book that registered with me um, and, and we've spent a lot of time studying that decision and interviewing people who have strong opinions, people from the different branches of the military, uh, uh, naval attorneys trying to kind of get a sense of you know what, what really was going on when they made that decision and um, you know, if, if you talk to Marcus uh, and ask him if he regrets it. He says, no, he doesn't regret it. He said they made the best decision they could at the time with the, with the facts they had. Um, not killing the um, goat herders was not just a moral decision. They didn't think it was a, 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 a necessarily a tactically smart decision. You know, the, the guy who really has the answers to that is now not alive. His name is Mike Murphy. He's the one who took everyone's opinion and tried to make the best decision he could uh, in an environment that he had limited understanding of. You know, they, he didn't know if there were more goat herders. He didn't know if the Taliban had already discovered where they were and were using those kids um, as uh, scouts to figure out which is, uh, you know, was a tactic that the Taliban would deploy. 
He didn't know whether um, you know they were on the verge of being attacked. He, he clearly made the decision to let them go. If, if you asked Marcus today, and we've been in Q&A where people have asked him whether he regrets it, he says, no, absolutely not. That's, they, don't, they don't live in the world of regrets. Mm. Um, if you ask me, knowing what I know now, I probably would have killed those, those goat herders and had my friends alive. But um, that goes to what this gentleman said, that well, fog of war, war is hell. And these are the kinds of decisions that we're asking these young men to make. And, 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 and that, that's another reason why we wanted to make the film. That the idea that you know, when I was 24, I wasn't standing on a mountaintop with the lives of, th of you know, three unarmed civilians in my hand and trying to figure out what the correct decision was. And, and these are decisions that these guys, Navy SEALs, have to make on a daily basis. In Israel, uh, the Israeli Special Forces have to make equally uh, you know, complicated and dangerous decisions uh, and with you know, very high stakes. So th th these are, this is one of the reasons why we wanted to make the film. And, and you, there is no there is no simple answer to that. Okay, last one. Could I ask that if there are veterans here, that they would stand and we could thank them? Sure. If, is there, are there any veterans in the house today? Any veterans?